So we get this uh, step mark of an arrow here. Uh, first plug in the zero, that goes away. And then this, is vaginal size by 0.5 minus 3. So what happened there? Sarah? Uh, 6 divided by 0.5 is 12, not okay. 3. So where did she get confused? Maybe multiply it by 0.5 instead of divide by 0.5? Or um, it's more common if we leave it as a fraction, if you divide by a half, a lot of times we, instead of dividing by half, we multiply by uh, one half or divide by two or something. It's a pretty common mistake I see. So, um, so multiplied by 0.5 instead of divide. Okay, so six divided by 0.5 is 12. So let's see, that would be 11 there, then 12 would be right there. There. X is correct, so X is, the X intercept is 2, but the Y intercept is 12. So there we go. <coughs> and actually, you know what, I, I think uh, it doesn't even say to graph. Uh, so just finding the X and the Y intercept, found the Y intercept. Uh, how about Sheridan had checked to see if 3 was correct? Anyone? Put, put what in? Put, put, put 12 in. Oh, she wants to check and see if 3 was correct. So put 3 in. 3 in for what? For y. For y. What about x? Put in 0. 0, right? 0 is what we put in for x. So we just want to check if x is 0 when we put in, point, and we put in 3 for y, does it come out to 6? Of course, it does not. Okay. Um, so, and y equals 3, and x equals 0. That's what we want to do. Okay. Here we see some good work, quality work. Um, and just so we understand the thought process here, um, I want you to write down why does Emerson plug in 0 for y. I want you to use pencils or your pens and write these things down in words, allegedly. Later when you go in back and access this memory, see your hand writing down these answers. So we, maybe we do this, maybe we do plug in zero, but we don't realize why. So why do we do this? Why are we plugging in a zero for y? It's not a random idea. Yeah, yeah zero is a really easy number to plug in for x or y. Uh, it leaves just one variable in the equation, and you can solve for x. Okay? It's not because we're, we're told to or we remember to do that. Uh, it's just, it's the most convenient. Plug in zero for y. X is the only variable. Do a little bit of uh, manipulation, and you can solve for x pretty easily. Okay, so makes it easy to solve for x. Why do you plug a zero in for x? Because our, our whole goal here is to graph these lines, right? That's the, the overarching goal. And uh, to graph a line, we need to know at least what? The minimum amount we need to know. Two 
points. Those are two really easy points to find. If you plug in zero for y, zero for x, it makes it very, very simple. Okay. Um, what are those two points called that we just found? Killing it. Okay. X and y intercepts. We have where we where the line intercepts the x-axis, we have the x-intercept. Where the intercept or the line intercepts the y-axis, we have the y-intercept. Found those two points pretty quickly and easily. We graph them, draw a line between them. All right. Um, any questions from the homework? Feel free to raise your hand and ask a question. And if you don't have a question, you can just pass it in. Oh, yes, Alex? 44. 44. Okay, so the perimeter of a rectangle, rectangular park is 72 feet. Let x be the park's width and y be its length. Uh, write an equation for the perimeter. So it's always a good idea to draw a picture. Okay, what, uh, what's a perimeter? What is the definition of a perimeter? walk along here and measure your whole walk, that would be the perimeter, all right? So we got a, a length here and a width. This length would have to be the same as this. It's a rectangle, same for the width. Uh, write an equation for the perimeter, and we know the perimeter is 72. Okay. And they, they mention length and width, so I'm sure they want, to us want us to incorporate length and width in our equation for the perimeter. So all these, what would we do with them to find the perimeter? Okay, 2x plus 2y, I, I use w and l, and I don't want to get my eraser, so I use w and l equals 72, it's very good. Two of those w's, there's one, there's another one, two of those l's, that's all four sides, we add them up, we get 72, there's our equation. Find the intercepts of the graph of the equation you wrote, and then graph the equation. Okay, now there's no... Which, which one should be the horizontal axis, which one should be the vertical, doesn't really matter. We could make this W and this one L. How are we going to find the intercepts? Make the L intercept or Y intercept, that vertical one. How are we going to find that intercept? Plug something or for L? Plug something in for L? Like what? Uh, zero? I don't know. Zero. zero. Okay, so if we want to find the intercepts, that's where we're crossing either this axis or this axis. Well, if we're crossing this axis, for instance, then 
but we're not up here and we're not down here, we're right in the middle of uh, positive numbers and negative numbers. What's the number between positive and negative numbers? Zero. Okay, so if, if we're not up or down, then L is zero, so if we set L equal to zero, or put a zero in for L, we get this equation. So w equals 36 when l equals w, or l equals 0, excuse me. So w is horizontal, that'll be the first one. Um, so 36 and l is 0. And there's 36 comma 0. Right. Now we're going to find this intercept. W, switch it around, plug in zero for W. So if uh, W is zero, this goes away, and we're just left with 2L equals 72. Um, yep. And so L also would equal 36 if W were zero. Kind of silly idea. So you get zero comma 36. Now, it wouldn't make much sense for L or W to be zero, right? Does that make sense? Because we're talking about a rectangular park. Wouldn't be much of a park if one of the sides of the park measured zero. It would be an imaginary, really skinny park. Okay. So this would be the absolute uh, you know, max out value of L, but it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. So somewhere in the middle, some value in the middle where W and L both are not zero make more sense. Uh, that's it. If someone really asks about any of that, which I think is funny. Um, any other questions? If you have no questions, you can just signify that by passing your homework. So raise your hand and ask questions, please, if you do have any. trying to do here is graph this function. You draw the graph of the solutions of this function. Notice that's what my objective is here, to graph the solutions of a linear equation. Remember, never forget that when we graph a graph, when we draw a graph, it's a picture of all the solutions to that given equation. And so if I give you an equation and you write down all these solutions, you could write them down on the table or order pairs or any number of ways. And then a graph is another way to represent all those solutions. Numbers x and y to satisfy the equation, to make the equation true. <coughs> and we're looking for two very simple points to find. Okay. So we're going to use the same I the, the idea that we used uh, in the previous section, where we're going to plug something in for one of the variables, and then just figure out what the other variable would have to be. I want you to think about the previous section, numbers that turned out to be really simple to plug in. Um, and if you'll notice, y is already solved for. It's already by itself. If we can get a number on this side, then uh, make our lives be easy. Right? So with all that said, what's, what's a number that would be really easy to plug in for x? Do all these whatever computations on the right side of the equation, and then y will be the result be an easy number to plug in for x. Zero. Zero is still easy. Still a miracle number. Right. Y equals 3 times 0. That turns out to be really, really easy when it's written this way. When y is by itself on one side of the equation. Okay. Y being by itself on one side of the equation is like a main feature of, of this form that we're looking at. What's called the slope-intercept form. If we put a zero in for x, then y is just that other number that was on this side. And if we, if we always write it as y equals a number times x plus some other number, and we plug in zero for x, we'll just 
just get that other number, whatever that number was. So y is just 4. So we get this point 0, 4. That one's easy. Now we're just looking for another easy, it's got to be something other than 0, because we already used 0. Something other than that, we can plug it for x, it would make the computations pretty easy. Right? Would one work? Why not? Right? Is there any reason we can't plug one in? We can plug one into any equation. In this equation, if you take a look at a 3 times 1, is that difficult? Other than 3 times 0, it's probably the easiest multiplication we could possibly do. 3 times 1. So y equals 3 times 1 this time. y equals 3 plus 4. That's 7. Seven. Now we've got our two points. That's all we need. We just move two points and we can connect them. Um, here, let's. I mean, we already graphed our, our line, but it would be nice if we could develop some kind of observations, some pattern of some kind. Let's just. Move on to the next point. It's probably the easiest value after 0 and 1 to plug in for x. 2 wouldn't be too hard to plug in for x here. 3 times 2 plus 4. 6 plus 4. And 10. Okay. Okay, so let's, let's start here. We're at 7 right here, right? 1 comma 7. If we start here, and we move over to 2, at x is 2, how, how many more do we have to go up to the, get to that next point? 3. 3, we just go up another 3. 1, 2, 3. It's almost right. Almost looks good. 2, comma 10. We have 0. Do uh, one more in this direction. Go to three. Y equals three times three. We've done zero. We've done one. We've done two. Now we're plugging in three. Nine plus four. Thirteen. So we have the point three, thirteen. Okay. We start at this point. We move over one on the in the x direction over to three. X is three. How far up do we have to move to get to the next point? 10, 13, three. 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 three, move up three. All right about there, one, two, three, there we are, three, 13. Notice in a, a pattern there, to get from one point to the next, you just have to do what to get from one point to the next point? Up three or down three and over, over is important. Mm -hmm. Over one. So we move over one and we move uh, up three. So to the right one and up three, or we move to the left one and down three. Okay. Either way, we can get from one point to another point. Now, I said the next point, I don't, I don't want to leave it there. Because there's points in between these two points, there's an infinite number of points all along this line that we could go to. But if you looked, it would be a ratio of one over and three up. We can move over a half, and we'd have to go up one and a half, and that'd be a ratio of three to one. one ratio of three to one. <coughs> okay. Um. Take that, take that for yourself in your notes, and uh, use the same kind of an idea. You're just plug it in really convenient values for x. You're about to pick any ones you want. Zero seems to be really nice. This one work really well here. All right, we just got a process that they went through.
kind of stuck. Kind of stuck, okay. Yeah, so I put zero for x. So you got two? Okay. And what did you do with that? So it, <coughs> so it was zero comma two, right? Okay, yeah, good. So x was zero and y was two. So we got one point. So uh, when you put in zero for x, you got y is two. Then what did you do? And then I put zero in for y. Okay, put zero in for y. Um, I'm going to subtract with 2, negative 3x, and divide by negative 3, x is equal to 2 thirds. Okay? So, is that what you did? Yeah. All right. So, x is 2 thirds when y is 0. Okay, cool. Certainly, like, a completely legitimate point. It's correct. And... Now we have enough points to draw the graph. Um, so, what I want you to think about is, seeing that this equation is has already been given to us in a way that y is by itself. Um, might it be easier to plug another number in for x instead of zero for y, and then just do you know, a little bit of addition, and then now you know what y is. Okay. See what I'm saying? My thought process is there. Okay. So that's great. That's that's fine. Um, but it might be, and it, that's what we we're talking about in the last section. A little bit easier to do something else. We found in the last section plugging in zero for x and y was really convenient. Um, if it happens to be that it's already solved for y. Y is already by itself. So if we put something in for x, we don't have to do this whole uh, add, subtract two from both sides and divide both sides by something to solve for whatever y is already solved for. So that's an idea, but maybe it's a little easier to plug something in for x. So what might be something that's easier to plug in for x and then figure out what y would have to be getting out? One. Multiplying by one is very simple as well. So y equals negative three times one plus 2. y equals negative 3 plus 2. y equals negative 1. So that gives us the point x is 1. y is negative 1. Negative 1. And by doing that, it also makes it a little bit nicer to plot that point, because it's right at two whole numbers, or two integer numbers. Um, we don't have to guesstimate where that fraction is. So it's, um, not better, not more right, not correct, and the other's incorrect, or whatever. It's just maybe a little <coughs> easier, a little more convenient. That's all it's about. So we can connect these points. Now, if we're just trying to graph the line, we're done. That's all we had to do. But we would also like to develop uh, some kind of a, a pattern, maybe a shortcut for ourselves uh, as we work through these. So. Maybe if we go to the next value of x, like 2. Uh, negative 4. Okay, so if I start at this point and I moved over to x is 2, where do I go from there to get to this point to negative 4? So move over to 2, then I have to do what to get down to 2, negative 4? Down four from here? Yeah. We're at negative one though. For y already. So we go down to negative four, we only have to move down three from there. Right? Move down three. If we start here and move move over one, we only have to go down three from there. Okay? Well, let's say that we were to plug in three. Let's not even do that this time. We did it in the last problem, but if we did plug in three, what do you think the y value would be? Negative eight, why negative eight? Mm -hmm. We're down four more. Let's review though. We moved over one from here, right? This was at this was at one negative one. And then uh, this is two. 
two, negative four. So if we moved over one, how many did we move down to go from here to there? Three. Three. So then negative seven. If we go over and we move down three more, we get down to three, negative seven. And if we move over one more to four, what point do you think that would be? Four. So in this one, we move to the right uh, one, and up three. In this one, we move to the right one, and down three. Or we move to the left one, and up three. Either way, it's all the same. So we're just starting to get this, this notion, maybe, of this, this pattern that's coming up. X is a fraction. <coughs> We've done a, a few of these, right? One together, one individually. We just want to find two points. What is probably the first easiest point to find? We do to find that point. We make it really easy to find. Bridget? So zero and for x. Zero and for x. So if we get one that's like this, like what do I mean by like this? Yeah? Fraction. Well, not exactly a fraction. Like these weren't fractions. We still started out the same way, right? So, like what have all of these equations, these three equations we've done so far, what are they all? had consistently in common, Danielle? Y by itself. Y by itself, Y is already by itself, okay? So when Y is by itself, that's something called slope-intercept form, and we'll keep moving along here to figure out why it's called that, okay, slope-intercept form. So when it's like that, it seems to be that the easiest first thing to do is what? Plug zero over X, can't say it enough times. Make you say it over and over. Plug in zero for x now. Do we really need to, to write all that down? Plug in zero for x. Okay. When we plugged in zero for x, these last three equations, what number do we get for y? Negative two. What, yeah, whatever the constant. We don't get the same number, but we do get whatever this constant is. That's what y will be if x is zero, which is pretty clear. If we put zero in for x, this term will go away. All that's left on this side is the constant. So, 0, negative 1. Okay. So there's the, the intercept part of the slope-intercept form. If we plug in 0 for x, this number always comes out to be the y-intercept. This one, too. So y-intercept. If we plug in 0 for x, we get just that number. This one, also, this is going to be the y-intercept. So that's the intercept part, the y-intercept form. Uh, so the y-intercept is negative 1. We have the point 0, negative 1. Right? That's immediate. We can just pull that right out of the equation without having to do really any work. We realize if we plug in 0 for x, we just get that constant back for y. So there's our y-intercept just sitting there waiting to be taken and graphed. Okay. Now. In the previous two, we, we plugged in 0 for x, that was easy. Plugged in 1 for x, that was easy. Okay. If we come to this one, I want you guys to, to just think for a minute on your own. If you don't come up with it, that's fine. But I want you to think, we could plug in 1 for x. I want you to think again about what's more convenient than that, maybe. Is there a more convenient value to plug in for x? that would make our, all our computations just a little bit easier, a little bit smoother, okay? So take a minute. You can sit there and stare in space, or you can write things down, or whatever, but give it some thought, and then we'll...
talk about it. Okay, so just to maybe put it out there, that one may not be the easiest thing. If we plug one in there, that's fine. But if we think about it, multiply by one, we're going to have to deal with 2 thirds minus 1. You're going to have to find common denominators. You're going to have a fraction. We can see uh, that since this number is less than 1 and this number we're subtracting is 1, we're going to get a negative fraction. And it's doable that, that exists. That point can be plotted. Maybe there's something easier so we don't wind up with a fraction. Bridget? Three turns out to be a nice, easy number to plug in for x. Why is that? Uh, right, if we multiply by uh, 3 over 1, if you want to think of it as 3 over 1, then we get 6 over 3. So now, what Bridges does is cause the numerator to be a multiple of 3, to have a factor of 3, so that 3 can divide the, the numerator. I think that's pretty smart. So 6 divided by 3 is 2 minus 1, and we get 1. So we plug in 3, nice easy number. We get out 1, nice easy number, whole number. So we get the point 3, 1. We could mess around with this point, 1 comma, negative 1 third. Okay. Hard to graph though, we have to deal with fractions. Maybe we don't like that, okay. Shouldn't be afraid of fractions, but if we can do it without fractions, that's nice. So we plug in 3 and we get out 1. That did turn out to be nice and simple. So if we were to need to just graph the line, we're done. So we plug in 3, that was easy. We can keep going on with our lives by connecting these two points and creating a line. Conveniently pull out this value as the y-intercept. Maybe we could use that other value as a nice little shortcut. I want you to think again for not as long, but after three, let's just say we'll keep going in the positive direction. Let's go in the positive direction, and I want you to think for a second what would be the next number after three that would uh, simplify our lives. It would be pretty easy to plug in that number for x. Any ideas? Or is easy to plug in? Important? Um, six. Six, right? Why, why does six turn out to be nice and convenient? Um, 12 divided by three. 12 divided by three. So again, you get a multiple of three, and you divide it by three, and that's not a fraction anymore. So y equals 2 thirds times six minus one. y equals, we could do uh, like six over one, the 12 over three minus one. 4 minus 1, that's 3. So we move over to 4, 5, 6, comma, 3. Okay, so to find a point and then another point and another point, it turns out it's really convenient to move over in chunks of 3. Move over to 3 for x. That's going to cancel out this denominator of, well, let's move down here, cancel out the denominator of 3, and we're left with a 2. Here we move on to 6. That's going to cancel out this 3, leave a factor of 2. 2 times 2 is 4. What would be the next convenient value of x? 9 would be convenient. So we just keep moving to the right by 3s. Okay, what if we went negative? What would be a convenient negative number to plug in? Negative 3, negative 6, negative 9. Okay. So, if you were to say, I'll just make up another equation, y equals uh, 5 fourths x minus 2, okay. what would be your y-intercept? Okay. Negative 2. You plug in 0 for x, that x thing gets eliminated, and we're just left with negative 2. Y-intercept is really easy to find. Okay. And after that, we 
Just plug in one, two, three, four, five, whatever you want. What do you think along this line? What would be the, the next easiest number to plug in for x? Four, how did you decide four? Because the denominator is four. When the denominator is whatever, that's the number that you want to move over to next. That would be the next number you want to plug in for x. So in this case, we'd like to plug in three, and then six, and then nine, and then whatever multiples of uh, three afterwards. So the next easiest point would be over three. Okay. So you move over three. And how far up did we move to get to this point? Here or there? One negative one if you need a reminder, or zero negative one. So you move over to three. All right. So we moved over three, and how many do we move up? Two. We went from negative one to one, that would be a shift up of two. We move over three again to six, and how many do we move up? Two. If you moved over to 9, where do you think that would put you? 9, comma, 5. Move up another 2. What if you move this direction? If you went down to negative 3, where would that put us? There, negative 3, comma, 3. We're just going to add another 2 on every time we move over 3. Because every time we go to the next multiple of 3, right? 3 is cancel, 2 times 1, so you're going to add 1, 2. And then 3 uh, is cancel here, we get 2, 2 times 2, so you're going to add on a 2 and, an and another 2 to get up to that next point. If we move over to 9, and we would cancel out, we get a 2 times 3, so we're adding on 3 2s. So we just keep adding on another 2 every time we move over 3. What about this one? Right? The next easiest number to plug in for x is 4. Okay. We move over 4. How far would you say we move over? Very good. your guess given that for this one you move over three and up two. So you move over to four. That's when we plug in four for x, that's going to cancel out that denominator of four. And we're going to add on how much? To negative two. Five. Add on five. Right? If we were to plug in four for x, okay, here's a, like our starting point at negative 2, our y-intercept at negative 2. These 4s are going to cancel out, and we're just going to be left with 5 minus 2, or negative 2 plus 5. So we move over 4 and up 5, so that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that puts us at 4, 3. Okay. After 4, what would be the next easiest number to plug in for x. Yeah? Eight. eight. Move over to eight. So you'd move over four more. Four and then another four. That's going to be eight. That's a multiple of four. We want multiples of four because we cancel out this denominator of four. Okay. And we can plug in eight and we can figure it out, but we can also follow the pattern. Hey, I just move over four to eight and then I'll just I'm going to be adding on another what? Another 5. There we go. So we move over 4, move up 5. Well, we move over 4 from there, that gives us 8. And we move up 5 from there, that gives us also 8. So does anybody know what we call that when you move up 5 and over 4, over 4 and up 5? 
the slope of that line. So moving up five and over four. We call this the rise, and this the run. Rise is definitely a vertical thing. Run, you usually run horizontally. Okay. So this is our slope. So someone could, so this is a, you know, we're reporting this right now, and they could skip all the stuff that we've explained, we've noticed, made observations of, and we could just start right here and just know how to do it. All right, so if you're looking for this is how I do it, you can tune in here. It was not the best. It would be great if you could understand why we can just pull these things out of the equation. If not, Grab some lines. All right. So we noticed in the previous problem we plug in zero for x, easiest value to plug in for x because it just eliminates that, and that tells us that the y-intercept is what? Y-intercept is one. If we plug in zero for x, we get one. Straight out of the equation, that will always work. The y is 1. Okay. Um, and all we need is another point. And we could use our observations in this pattern to say the next easiest point to find, I would, where would I go from this point? value of x to plug into that equation? 5. Because if you plug into 5, you can multiply 3 fifths times 5. 3 fifths times 5 over 1. Now that numerator is going to be a multiple of 5. Denominator is going to be 5. And 5 is going to divide the numerator. So we move over to 5. And how far up are we going to move when we move over to 5? We're going to move up 3. <coughs> As we plug in 5 in there, 5 cancels out for 5, we're just left with 3 to add on to 1. So this is 0, 1. This is 5, 4. So we moved up 3 from 1. And we have two points to draw our line. <coughs> so we get our y-intercept. We get our slope. Okay. Which means it's three fifths. Which means right, this is a positive three, so we're gonna move up. Up. Okay, and back up. Three. And right five. So it's just rise over. rise over run before you. Yeah. Okay. So why just tell you the exact same thing again? If just telling you was the secret to knowing it, you would just know it because you've already been told it. Okay. I'm going to help you see why that is. Why do we move up 3 and over 5, or over 5 and up 3? What's going on with that? Because that's the next convenient value to find. Uh, the next convenient value to plug in for x. The next nice, uh, easy point to plot. You could also find any point in between here, but all the points in between these two are going to involve some fractions, some kind of guesstimating about where they are. But if we have a, a graph, like especially if we have a nice grid, this lands right in the intersection of two grid lines. So it's just the easiest to graph, the next easiest one to graph. Okay. So I'm going to give you uh, one to do on your own that you just 
use what you've learned. Um, this is number eight. Take advantage of all of the observations that we've made. Um, perhaps the added challenge is that negative in front of the fraction. Let's see if you can just uh, plot a couple of points. Yeah, this line. Okay. So where is a nice, simple, quick to find starting point? Okay, if we put zero in for x, which means we're going to be somewhere on the y-axis, right? What do we get? Uh, zero, eight. zero comma eight. So one, two, three, six, seven, eight. We can do that computation in our heads, right? Put zero in for x. Eight is what you get for y. Zero eight. Found our y-intercept real fast, no problem. We start here, and. Where, what, what moves can we make now to get to the next real easy point? We're good. Uh, I plug in four for x. Okay, plug in four for x makes it real easy, right? So we move over to x is four. Okay, which is just the denominator of this fraction. So move over to four, and uh, then where? Or what do you get for y? I got seven. Seven, okay. Because you plug in four for x, four cancels with four, and what are you left with? Negative one. So you go down one. Now that's a little different than what we have done so far, okay? Uh, we've been moving to the right and up, to the right and up. For, for all of the examples that we've done so far, except for the second one. The second one, we also had a negative slope. Okay. This one has a negative slope, which means we don't move to the right and up, we move to the right and down. Because we move over to four, we get a negative number. We're going to take a number away from eight, so whatever that initial value is. So we move down one, and we have enough points to draw a line. Got four, seven. <coughs> if we moved over to <coughs> four, to eight, move over to eight, what would we move down from there? How much? Down one, down another one. So over another four and down another one, that's going to take us over to four plus four is eight. And seven moving down one from seven would get us to six. Eight comma six. There we go. Quite a few examples of graphing in this convenient form when y is by itself, when y is, uh, or when the equation is in what's called slope intercept form. Right. It's called the slope intercept form because here's our slope, here's our intercept, and that's the form that it's in, slope intercept form. If you wanted to get an equation into slope intercept form, what would you say you have to do? Get y by itself. Get y by itself. To get y by itself, it's over. It's in slope intercept form. So let's talk about the different kinds of slopes. Right. Let's say we have a positive slope. Positive slope. So all we know about this line is that it's a positive slope. How would you describe what all lines with positive slopes, what they all have in common? What, what will be in common about their shapes? Okay. You're going from the left to the right. If you move left to right, they're going up. Right? Good. That's what we call rising. Or we say that line rises. Because remember, slope is just rise over run. And if both of those things are positive, we're going to move, say, from this point up something that's positive and to the right. That's positive. We can even go the other direction. We can go down. That's negative. right? The rise is negative. And then the run is negative. That's negative over negative, which also is positive. Okay. So it rises. So if we have a negative slope, we 
you say all the, the lines of negative slopes have in common? They go down? Down. Instead of going up from left to right, they go down from left to right. So you know, we're talking from left to right. So here we would say it falls, right? From left to right, it falls. Common, common uh, verbiage there. If we start at this point, uh, rise, we go down, right? That's a negative, and we move to the right, that's positive. That's negative, that's negative rise divided by positive run. Negative divided by positive is negative. We go the other way. We go positive rise, but then the run is to the left, that's negative, that's positive divided by negative is a negative slope. Copy that line and just moved it somewhere else. It could be on the graph somewhere. Okay. What are those lines' relationships to each other? What, how do we describe those two lines in the way they're right next to each other? Like that? <laughs> Parallel, which means what about those two lines? Yeah. They'll never touch anywhere. If we move in this direction forever, they'll never touch. If we move in this direction forever, they'll never touch. Parallel. What is a parallel? What is something that's definitely true about two lines that are parallel? A big gap to jump over here, but if we can do it, that'd be great. Hmm? What? It's a little chirp somewhere in the room. Can I ask a question? Question. What can we definitely say is true about two lines that are parallel? They've got to have something in common. What do they have in common? They're on the same plane. They're on the same plane. That's good. That's definitely true. That's like real, real uh, philosophical right there. Yeah? Okay, both po what about, what's positive? They're both positive slopes. Their slopes are both positive. You can't have a positive and a negative slope and not cross each other, right? So definitely they're both positive. Can, can they even be more than that? More than just both positive. <coughs> both positive slopes. Or both negative. Get even more in common. This one's slope is, let's just call it three over five. Just call it that. Rise over run. Three over five. Care to venture a guess about that line? It's the same pattern. If we don't want them to, to cross, and right, if you're like walking at a slant next to your friend and you don't want to cross paths, you would have to follow the exact same pattern. Go up and over the same amount. So this one would also have to go up three and over five. So parallel lines. So parallel is something that describes a picture of a line, right? A picture. Parallel lines, meaning they never cross, have uh, have what kind of slopes? Excuse me, slope. The same. Same slope. The same slopes, or equal slopes. Somebody asks you, are these two lines parallel? What's your check? What is the test for, to see if those two lines are parallel? Check the rise over run. Check the rise over run. Is the rise over the run for this line the same as the rise over run for this line? Yes, they're parallel. No, they're not parallel. That goes for positive slopes and negative slopes and the exact same slope. Get in some, uh, some good practice here, like uh, 
18. to write that in slope intercept form. In case we forgot, what do we have to do to get in slope intercept form? Y by itself? Okay. Get Y by itself. How about um, just give ourselves like a, a finishing point. Has someone done all the work and this is it? Y equals Y equals three Three. 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 Well, if we just bring it y by itself, y won't be a specific number, right? We want it to be y equals slope times x plus y intercept. Okay? So we, we don't want to plug anything specific in for x. That's, yeah, we just we want the other side to have x in it. So let's, let's run through it together. Just want to get y by itself and, and leave everything else alone, in as much as we don't plug in anything in for x. Uh, what would be something we can do first? Not something we have to do, but it's probably a really common thing that we do. I get y by itself, yeah? Like to get y on the other side You get y on the other side, you can move everything else to the other side. Add 3y on, Add 3y on both sides, okay? That works. This is eliminated now, 3y. So 6x equals, let's say, 3y minus 9. All right, so now y's over there, and it's positive. That's nice. Add 9. Add 9 to both sides. 6x plus 9. I'm just going to write it like this. Because we like y to be like, we can write y over here, there. Let's say it's the, there's no difference there. And now we need y, just y, not 3y, but just y. Do you divide everything by 3? Now, if this is 3y equals anything else, right? 3y equals 15, divide by 3. 3y equals 27, divide by 3. 3y equals 5, divide by 3. We're going to divide the side by 3. Both sides by 3. Now, this, this is correct. 6x plus 9 over 3 is correct. Correct answer. Uh, but we want to write it specifically in y-intercept form, which means a number times x plus y-intercept. Okay. So what we need to do is let's go ahead and divide everything by 3 individually. Okay, divide this by 3, divide this by 3. So 6 thirds x plus 9 over 3 y equals 6 divided by 3 is 2, 2x plus 3, 2x plus 3. Yeah? Um, why don't you just put 2 over 1? 2 over 1, if we want to make it real clear, this is the rise and this is the run, yeah. then yeah. We don't have to, like this understood, all numbers are over 1 if we want. Um, so, yeah, either way that you like it. Now, this number, the slope, is given m. I don't know. I should probably uh, look into that as a lover of math history. And this one's called b. That's for y is b. But there you are, m and b. So the general form for slope intercept is m x plus b, which I don't think surprises most of you. Probably have seen that before. Like but M, if, if, uh, if we make reference to an M, well, that M must have something to do with the slope in this context. And B must have something to do with the y-intercept in this, concept, in this uh, context. Slope and y-intercept. Questions?